take a break. We'll just get through this in one shot. I think it's doable. All right, so regulation is a really important part of the supplement industry, and it makes sense to come from a frame of mindset of how are these products regulated, why are they produced, and a little bit of history first. Um, so the definition of a dietary supplement is a product intended to supplement the diet that contains one or more of the following ingredients, vitamin, mineral, herb, botanical, or amino acid. Um, so keep that in mind when you see products that are over the counter that are claiming to do certain things. So this has been an interesting gray area, and I'll show you kind of a, a funny example of this. Of, companies that basically are making drugs and trying to market them as supplements when actually they aren't legally a supplement based on this definition. So we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, this stuff I don't really care, you know, any of these definitions, but in case you're interested in like herbs versus botanical versus whatever, it's all pretty much the same. The FDA definition is there again, so you can take a look at that if you want the specific how the FDA would define a dietary supplement. And some fun facts, about 50% of people in the U.S. regularly take some form of vitamin or supplement. A $30 billion industry approximately, and this is a, a massive industry that's probably getting bigger and bigger as we speak. Um, so how do we deal with some of this? Well, some of the issues and recommendations to think about, most people aren't telling their primary care that they're taking supplements or consulting their primary care. They're probably just taking them based on advice of uh, friends or family. Uh, lots of people doing their own quote-unquote research. And uh, people like Dr. Osmond, they have funny videos, which is why I think it's funny. Anyway. Depending on how, how you feel about Dr. Osmond, I think it's funny. But we're going to watch it. I don't know if anybody saw this or heard about this, but. Um, on the Gulf Coast, U.S. mobile projects are expected to create over 45,000 jobs. These are jobs that natural gas is <laughs> all while reducing America's emissions. And it's true. <laughs> Um, I understand that you give a lot of information that's great information about health, and you do it in a way that's easily understandable. You're very talented. You're obviously very bright. You've been trained in science-based medicine. Now, here's three statements you made on your show. You may think magic is make-believe, but this little bean has scientists saying they found the magic weight loss cure for every body type. It's green coffee extract. Quote, I've got the number one miracle in a bottle to burn your fat. It's raspberry ketone. Quote, Garcinia Cambogia, it may be the simple solution you've been looking for to bust your body fat for good. I don't get why you need to say this stuff because you know it's not true. So why, when you have this amazing megaphone and this amazing ability to communicate, why would you cheapen your show? With regard to whether they work or not, take green coffee and extract as an example. Uh, I'm not going to argue that it would pass FDA muster if it was a pharmaceutical drug seeking approval. But among the natural products that are out there, this is a product that has several clinical trials. There was one large one, a very good quality one, that was done the year that we talked about this in 2012. I want them to know about that clinical trial. Because the only one I know was 16 people in India that was paid for by the company that was that was in fact, at the point in time you initially talked about this being a miracle, the only study that was out there was the one with 16 people in India that was written up by somebody who was being paid by the company that was producing it. Well, this paper argued that there was no one paying for it, but I have the four papers, five papers actually, plus a series of basic science papers on it as well. But, but Senator McCaskill, if I, we can spend a lot of time arguing the merits of whether being copy and extract is worth trying or not worth trying. Uh, many of the things that we argue that you do with regard to your diet are likewise criticizable. If I can just get across the big message that I, I actually do personally believe in the, in the items that I talk about in the show, I, I passionately study them. I recognize that oftentimes they don't have the scientific muster to present uh, as fact, but nevertheless, I would give my audience the advice I give my family all the time, and I've given my family these products, specifically the ones you mentioned, then, I, uh, then, I, then I'm comfortable with that part. I mean, I've tried to really do a lot of research in preparation for this trial, and the scientific community is almost monolithic against you in terms of the efficacy <laughs> of the three products that you call miracles. And when you call a product a miracle, and it's something you can buy, and it's something that gives people false hope, I, I just don't understand why you need to do, go there. <laughs> so it turns out if you um, lie a bunch on TV, eventually the government does get upset. <laughs> 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 
Um, I think it's just, it, I think, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be political, I have no idea who that senator is, what party she's with, or she's, what state she represents, I don't know her at all, but um, I think she makes a really good point, is one of the big things I, I preach when it comes to supplements is that when we talk about things with mixed evidence, you cannot give your people, patients, false hope. I think that's the big deal here. A lot of them are very safe to take, and sure, they may well be effective for certain mild things, and we might not have enough evidence to say one way or the other, and that's fine. But you can't tell them this is going to cure so and so. This is going to make sure your, your disease, you know, progresses in a positive way when you don't have evidence to resolve that. So that's kind of the point. Okay. Uh, so the FDA does not regulate any supplements. Prior to 1994, they actually were. And then, you know, you can read a number of conspiracy theories on why this happened. But basically, somebody got into somebody in Congress's ear, and they ended up coming up with this act called the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act which um, makes it so that dietary supplements are a separate entity from a food or a drug. So they aren't either one legally um, until that act is ever repealed or modified. We won't ever change that. So that's why the FDA does not regulate them and cannot technically regulate them. They can enforce some things. Um, but part of this uh, agreement of sorts was to say that, okay, we aren't going to regulate them, but um, they can't be intended to treat, review, prevent, cure, or diagnose disease. They can't have claims that say they do either. However, I'll show you some claims and how blurred that line gets on the labels in a second. Um, so again, not FDA approved. Pre-market testing and approval is not required for a supplement. And efficacy and safety data are not required either. The manufacturers are supposed to have some information, quote, on file to support efficacy claims, but this information isn't reviewed by anyone. So how many of them actually have anything? If they do, it's probably like the, the senator was pointing out, some study that they did in-house, paid for by themselves, People they handpick, it doesn't make anyone care. You know, it's it's, it's false evidence essentially. Uh, so how do we catch bad products? Well, we don't know how we do that. So there's a lot of problems with this whole system, and it's tremendously flawed for obvious reasons. The drug industry is flawed. This is way worse in my opinion. So uh, basically, you're innocent until proven guilty until you have some sort of a product that hurts somebody. Um, there's very likely chance that no one's ever going to call you out on some sort of a claim. And once you do it, it, it's very difficult to get a company to totally have to remove their product from the market. Um, ephedra products are one example of these. They're weight loss products. Basically, ephedra has some pseudoephedrine and stimulant-like derivatives that it gets metabolized into. And it was marketed as a weight loss supplement. And, and it was on the market for several years until uh, various um, forms of it were on the market for several, several years until People start getting cardiovascular complications, heart attacks, high blood pressure, that type of stuff, and uh, they took it off. However, there are ephedra extracts and other types of ephedra that weren't part of that class action case or that decision, so those still may <coughs> exist on the market, which is a little bit scary. Um, so why don't we evaluate them like drugs? Well, manufacturers don't have to. They sell $30 billion a year without doing it, so there's absolutely no point in investing money into the research. Um, there's also not a lot of government funding out there. Where there's a lot of government grants through the NIH that support you know, the university researching new pharmaceutical compounds into certain diseases. Not really a lot of money out there to say, hey, can you go study vitamin D and see if it you know makes people feel better? Um, you know that doesn't make sense in a study form, but people take it that way. Now, if you're talking about actual depression and like maybe a clinical trial for major depressive disorder, then that's different. But for some of the mild things people are taking supplements for, there's just no incentive out there to study it. Um, there are plenty of herbal remedies and dietary supplements that do have some proven benefits, and I'll touch base on a couple of the more common ones. Uh, Europe has a bit of a different system than we do. They regulate herbs like drugs. Uh, but a lot of these need more research. It's very difficult, even with the small amounts of research we have out there, to make firm uh, claims on really any of this stuff. And um, if a company, well, if, uh, if an herbal product's found to really have a strong benefit, some pharmaceutical company's probably going to get their claws on it, isolate that compound that's having the positive effect, and turn it into a marketable pharmaceutical agent to make more money off of it. So that's usually what we see. In fact, there are a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies that employ people who do things like that, who go and isolate the plant compounds to try and find new drugs. So we talked about claims. So what can you say on a drug or a, a, a supplement bottle? Structure, function, claims. So things like maintains a healthy urinary tract. Uh, and then of course you have to have a disclaimer that says the statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. The product not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases. Uh, health claims, FDA authorized. So this is another authorized claim. Reduces the risk of osteoporosis. So you can see, I mean, very close to talking about preventing a disease, but technically. 
it's reducing the risk. It's not coming outright and saying prevention. So you're, you have a very gray area here. Or nutrient content is like a good source of calcium or a good source of whatever you have. Unallowable claims. You can't make an express disease. You can't say this treats your hypertension and high blood pressure. Um, you can't say it controls blood pressure either. So very, very gray in how this is. So people can make, you know, get a good wordsmith on your company and they can figure out a way to make a claim that doesn't really sound like a claim. Um, however, interestingly enough, you can put disease claims in the name of your product. So cold away or migraine be gone, which <laughs> clearly <laughs> are trying to tell you what they're for, right? Uh, that's legal. So, you know, who knows? Um, common minor symptoms associated with life stages um, are not diseases. So things like hot flashes, PMS, mild acne, wrinkles, mild memory loss are not considered diseases. They're considered things associated with natural aging process. So you can make claims on those. All right, uh, GMP is good manufacturing practices. So all pharmaceutical companies, um, regardless of whether they're in the U.S. or other countries, are supposed to follow GMP, and the FDA will hold them to high standards to follow GMP. And GMP basically makes sure that your products are maintaining their integrity. So uh, it makes sure that, like, if you're using a big mixing batch, it makes a whole batch of tablet lactose and whatever to print it into tablets, but that's not right next to another big mixing batch full of some other type of drug, and they're kind of interfering with each other. So it's about identity, purity, quality, composition, and strength, and making sure all that's accounted for specifically. Um, GMP is only recently required for supplements, which is a bit scary. In 2007, there was some legislation passed saying they had to, um, supplement companies had to incorporate GMP over three years, depending on how many numbers of employees they have. So pretty much now, every supplement company should be following GMP, but again, the FDA doesn't even have enough resources to monitor a lot of the drug companies that are producing outside the country on a regular basis, uh, they certainly don't have enough resources to check up on all the supplement companies as well. Um, the GMP just generally prevents a couple things considered adulteration, misbranding, and non-standardization, uh, which adulteration is just a product of, problem with a product. It's a legal term uh, that is not important really for this class, but it just means that something got contaminated into it. So GMP prevents contamination, theoretically. Uh, misbranding is a problem with the label. So if you say your product has uh, 500 or yeah, let's say 1,000 units of vitamin D, and somebody tests it and actually has 200 units of vitamin D, that's misbranding. Um, standardization is that each batch contains the same amount relatively of active ingredients. So most things are all part of GMP, and supplement industry has only recently come around to that. Um, some products may be labeled legally as standardized, high potency, certified potency, or guaranteed potency. This isn't a real thing that they, they can say this legally, but there's no evidence to actually have that to back this up. It doesn't mean anything. Um, for example, there is a 1998 study of St. John's Work products that found they had 20 to 140% of their label claim amount in them, um, with several reputable brands. There's a more recent study the New York Times, the New York Inter Attorney General are actually sending a cease and desist letter to several really popular companies from GNC, Target, Walgreens, and Walmart. They pulled uh, different store brands of various herbal supplements, and uh, they did DNA testing, which some people argue wasn't maybe the best way to do it, but um, there's a Canadian study that had very similar findings, basically that most of the products didn't have any detectable amount of any of the labeled ingredients. Um, so they found things like carrot and legume DNA, different types of plant DNA, but like if it was supposed to be ginkgo, there wasn't any actual ginkgo that they could find. Um, so what happened? Well, I don't really know exactly. I know that there's a cease and desist letter sent that the companies were going to have to say, show that they could um, validate their testing to prove that they had some information on how to say that they actually could match up what is on the bottle to what uh, what they're saying is. So I don't know exactly whatever happened, but it seemed like it kind of blew over. As with a lot of things in this industry, you know, there's a lot of bluster occasionally, and then not anywhere that happens with it. Uh, one thing I will point out is a lot of these companies probably use the same, well, I don't know of this for sure, but I think a lot of them are using, uh, there might be like one big manufacturer that manufactures a bunch of vitamins and then, you know, up and up the Target brand or whatever packages it that way. Walmart has their own brand that packages it. So it's not like Walmart has their own vitamin factory. They're outsourcing it to whoever and buying it in. So it's not necessarily like Walmart and Target and whatever are bad companies, but um, they, they might be um, using companies that aren't really um, so sure of their own products. Uh, evaluating the product with third party is an option that some companies choose to do, and it's a good option. These are um, all pretty well-renowned um, 
things that you can get to validate your product. So USP is probably the best one. Um, USP not only has a bunch of purity standards that they publish, so like a pharmaceutical company has to follow a bunch of USP guidelines to make sure that their products are uh, up to specifications. So like I worked at a drug company and we'd have to do uh, products, to see, we'd have to test products using like HPLC, GC chromatography to make sure there weren't organic impurities in them. We had to meet specific specifications met by or set forth by USP. Um, so that's something that a company could legally do and send their supplement to and say, can you test this to make sure A, it doesn't have any impurities to it, B, it contains ingredients on the label and within a certain specification of how much we want to be in there. Um, and if they have that, uh, they can label that actually on their product. Mm -hmm. Consumerlab.com is a bit different. They actually test products randomly on the retail level and then will identify potency, purity, bioavailability. And consistency. This actually costs money, so they'd have to send it into Consumer Lab. Um, NSF uh, International is a nonprofit group that um, is independent. I, I think they do some random testing as well, but you can also send products into them. Uh, if you're wondering what this looks like, I don't know. I don't know if I ever see NSF or Consumer Labs very often on products, but to be honest, I haven't looked all that hard. I do know that Nature Made uses a lot of their products to USP, and you can see a little logo there. I'm not trying to advertise for Nature Made. They're just one of the examples I can think of that they actually standardize a lot of their products, so they make sure that a lot of their products are actually standardized. All right. So why do people actually take these? Um, there are a lot of legitimate uses. They're over the counter. Um, so people are paying for them out of pocket. Uh, so that could be an expense component to that. But um, you also have to consider that people might just think, well, maybe I should take this. Because they read on the label, it's good for bone health. So they take, you know, calcium vitamin D supplement. Uh, people want to be healthy, they assume a natural product or vitamin just as good for them or as, you know, anything else they're ingesting, like a healthy diet, goes kind of hand in hand with it. Um, people aren't necessarily traditionally opposed to uh, traditional medicine, although some people uh, may be, depending on how they view different products, so some patients may be very opposed to certain aspects of this, but open to other ones. It's kind of interesting when you talk to enough people what, what kind of opinions you get from various. Um, uh, uh, different vitamin uh, perspectives. Complementary versus alternative. We'll talk about CAM and that definition in a second. Uh, and then advertising and word of mouth, of course, is a big, big component to play in this. Okay, Prevagen is this example I found. So I was just sitting in my living room, my wife had something on TV, and this commercial came on for Prevagen, and I just kind of like started listening to it, and they're advertising like these memory, memory improvement claims and all this stuff. I'm like, there's no way this is legal, or what is? I was like, is this a new drug? Because it just didn't seem right. Um, so I looked into it a little bit, and it's got kind of an interesting story. So Prevagen <laughs> is an over-the-counter supplement. Um, it's this, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, opacorin or something. It's a synthetic protein that's derived from the bioluminescence process that certain jellyfish make. Now, why anyone would think that people need to consume this, I don't know. But um, it's it's not, and this is a great example of something that's not at all even close to a dietary supplement. So it's really a drug when you look at it. I mean, it's a product they're saying helps with brain health, and it's a memory supplement. But it has no actual um, place in our diet, per se. It's not like you're supplementing something. Uh, so that's a bit of a gray area, but I think this one definitely qualifies. So um, it's been with this company called Quincy Bioscience in Madison, Wisconsin. The FDA investigated them in 2012, which led to a ton of violations, saying that, A, this product's a drug. The website has tons of claims on it, like first and only dietary supplement that protects brain cells from death. Really? Uh, that's a pretty bold statement. Um, and the FTC slammed them with false and unsubstantiated claims. So they're getting hammered by two different major federal organizations. They're still in business and they still sell their products. So I don't really know whatever happened with this. Uh, Someday if I have more time, I might actually call the FDA and see if I can ask, but that, that sounds like that'd be like a lot of uh, work to do, so <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but in case you're wondering, the company recommends you take this for 90 days for full effects, which is about $100 of product you have to purchase. It's like 50 or it's like 30 to $40 for one 30-day supply. Uh, a bunch of people filed a class action lawsuit in 2015 saying that a number of things, it's a protein. So first of all, what do we know about protein products? You usually have to inject them, right, like your biologic products. If you ingest a protein, your body turns into amino acids. You don't absorb this protein. So really, all you're getting from it is probably a small dose of amino acids when all said and done, because it's being chewed up by your GI. 
Uh, it doesn't work, so um, there's not a lot of, they claim they have evidence for it. If you actually go to their website and look at it and read some of their clinical trials, they have a lot of stuff in there, but they're kind of confusing. They're um, funded by the company. There's no peer review. There's no published literature on it. It's just what the company's saying. And a lot of it's survey research, too, so who really knows? Um, uh, people claim there's some undocumented, ignored side effects, uh, clinical testing, drug, blah, blah, blah. Um, not actually a drug. It's actually a drug, but a supplement. So there's the following things that people are suing this company for. But again, it's still available in made at major retailers. So um, you can find it online at like wallwalgreens.com or target.com. We'll see. This is an example of how difficult or how easy it is to make a product that's kind of a complete sham and sell it to people. All right. I'm going to move on to vitamins and talk about some actual vitamins and some uses for them. Does anybody have any questions on the regulatory side of things? All right. Well, we can come back to that if you think of any. All right. So just another joke. McDonald's plus multivitamins does not equal a balanced diet. All right. So um, there, I'll talk about the standard versus the chemical name of the vitamins, and then also fat-soluble vitamins is a good thing to remember. So there might be a test question like, which is not fat-soluble vitamin A, D, and K are all fat-soluble. C and D vitamins are all water-soluble. Uh, your sources are dietary intake, enteric synthesis, and intrinsic synthesis, too. So I'll mention some of that as well. They're water-soluble. So basically, you can if you take a ton of vitamin C, you're just going to urinate off the stuff your body doesn't. So if you take with a mega C supplement, you're just wasting your money more or less. Uh, all right, so what are vitamins? There are crucial cofactors for multiple metabolic processes and enzymatic reactions. Um, do I need to take a daily multivitamin? Well, that really depends. Um, I think there is maybe cause for giving patients multivitamins if they're in a situation where they're severely malnourished. It can't hurt for most people. And for most people, I'd say, well, you know, it's whatever, $5 for a bottle of 100 multivitamins, might as well take them. Or they're gummy and they taste good, and I like taking them, <laughs> whatever it might be. Uh, but it's, it comes down to, you know, personal decision. I think most people, if you need a relatively balanced diet, you're getting everything you need. You know, if you're eating fruits and vegetables, even a small amount of them, that's really the total recommended. I think you're probably getting enough, but, you know, that's debatable, I think, some people would say. Again, uh, malnourishment uh, and genetic deficiencies might be a reason for um, supplementing people. And uh, toxicity is almost impossible from natural sources. So if you recommend somebody change their diet, like eat more fruit and vegetables to get more natural sources of vitamins, or even lots of things have vitamins, like meat and, and grains and stuff too, um, there is a, there's a good chance that they're going to absorb what they need and, and not get toxic. And you rarely get toxic, but if you do get toxic on vitamins, it's because you took too many supplements in most cases. All right, vitamin A, chemical names, A1, retinol, A2, dihydroretinol. Um, these are plant carotenoids, so leafy greens, yellow vegetables, and carrots, too. So beta carotene, lycopene, lutein are all types of uh, A vitamins that you'll read about. They're all very similar. They're all marketed very differently. Like you'll see lutein is like a pro-I antioxidant. You see that one come up in like a lot of the I formulated vitamins, like Occupite and Preservation. Um, they're present in fish, meats, uh, like liver, uh, and also a pretty high concentration of dairy products as well. So your body stores them in liver and fat, fatty tissue. So that's where if you're eating animal products, that's kind of where you can think about where you're going to get your vitamin A contact from. So roles. Uh, visual pigment lutein is part of vitamins for eye, macular degeneration. Just said that. Uh, cofactor synthesis in mucus forming cells. Um, involvement in multiple pathways of cell growth and differentiation. And um, we use it for a couple different things. So uh, acne treatment is probably the biggest one. The RX, the prescription strength derivatives we use for acne, whether it be the topical ones or uh, like oral ones like isotretinine. Um, there's a lot of oral supplements. And really, as far as use goes over the counter, I think most of the time it's going to be some combination of a, a deficiency advertised product for, um, for eye health. So you know, Occubite and Preservision are kind of the two brand names of those products, and a lot of people take them. Um, I'll talk about that with vitamin E a little bit, too. There's a couple other things they formulate into it, but most of it's like lutein and vitamin E are the two big ones. All right. That's pretty much it for vitamin A as far as use goes. Toxicity, it is the most toxic supplement. Uh, you have to take a lot of it over a long period of time to really get toxic. Um, and if you took a ton of it, you might get some really bad GI upset. I mean, if you took 100 times a daily dose of anything, you'd probably feel a little bit sick. Uh, so that's really, I don't think that's a bad big of a deal. Um, but over time, you can get bone and muscle pain, loss of appetite, skin and hair disorders, liver damage, 
Uh, the GI bleeding trend, genicity is a big one too. So pregnant patients should really lay off vitamin A supplementation. It's okay if it's like it's part of their prenatal and it's in a small amount, but they should be taking a huge amount of it. Uh, no one really should, but you know, if they, if they are coming into their pregnancy, that's a big deal, I think. Um, and beta carotene actually seems to increase lung cancer risk with smokers. So smokers should also probably lay off the heavy vitamin A supplementation. All right, vitamin D, our, our best friend. We talked about this a lot already. It's a super popular supplement. I swear, everybody who comes into the hospitals on vitamin D or, or fish oil or both. Those are probably the two most popular ones I see in the general population. Um, and I think the mantra is that it doesn't really hurt anyone. It might help people, so let's give it to everyone. And most people in Minnesota are probably deficient to a certain degree. So yeah, there's some there's some rationale behind it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying there's um, maybe not as much evidence to support the, the logical rationale. So a couple different forms. We've talked about these a little bit already. Vitamin D2 and D3 are the over-the-counter products. You're going to see uh, ergocalciferol versus colocalciferol. So ergocalciferol is not made in the body. Colocalciferol is. Um, it's synthesized by the skin via UV light. So this is the stuff you get from sunlight exposure. And it's actually the only vitamin that we synthesize in the body. Everything else we need to take dietary. So uh, 10 minutes of exposure to a small amount of skin with sunlight. Um, but if you're in the winter and you're north of Atlanta, Georgia, like we are here, you can't actually synthesize it because you don't get the right UV wavelength to support that reaction. So that's why people in our climate and in northern climates tend to be deficient. Now, is that really a cause for concern? That's the big debate. Uh, there's some studies out there. Some of them say yes, some say no. Uh, vitamin D and calcium. So vitamin D also facilitates absorption of calcium from the GI tract. We talked about this a lot already. And of course, that's a major role in treatment of uh, osteoporosis. So. Usually we give them two together, so it's a really common combination supplement used for vitamin D. Uh, other roles are pretty theoretical, I would say. So immune system, there's been some studies looking at immune function. Um, deficiency, people who are deficient may be at re increased risk for general infections like colds and stuff, but um, the evidence is a bit sketchy. Cancer, uh, studies are inconsistent. Uh, there might be some benefit in preventing colorectal calcium colorectal cancer, excuse me, but it's it's maybe linked to calcium absorption as well, so I'm not really sure if they can say that's really vitamin D per se. Uh, and cardiovascular, um, increased blood pressure and CD risk has been shown with deficiency too. The thing is, is you can show a lot of correlations with deficiency. The problem is you can't show a lot of benefit with supplementation. So it's difficult, and I think that's the moral of the story when it comes to giving people oral multivitamins and stuff. You don't get uh, as good of results as you might as if they were eating kind of a regular diet or supplementing all along. By the time you're deficient, the damage might be done. It can be difficult to reverse that, specifically with supplementation alone. Uh, mental health, we'll talk about more during depression. There is some positive evidence, specifically when added on to existing antidepressant therapies. By itself, it doesn't really have all that much weight. Uh, but there has been a couple of decent trials that show if you combine it with some of the more common antidepressants, you get a better effect than if you just gave one of the antidepressants alone. Uh, and there's a lot of, again, a lot of interesting correlations with deficiency. Type 1 diabetes, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, and all cause mortality in general. So people who are deficient generally have a higher chance of dying. But it doesn't show you that taking it decreases your mortality. So again, it's a bit controversial. Um, comparing climates is kind of interesting too. So there's been some evidence looking at uh, whether people in certain climates are vitamin D deficient, if that's correlating with these types of diseases too. And uh, if you remember with type 1 diabetes, people in northern climates tend to maybe get it more than people in, in closer to the equator. Is that a cor correlation coincidence? Maybe. Uh, I don't think we can say anything else about that at this time. All right, sources and supplements. A lot of foods are fortified. Fish and meats tend to be really high in vitamin D. Uh, so, of course, can be a catch-22. It's great for vitamin D, and unfortunately, it has skin cancer as well. So, take the take the good with the bad. Minimize moderate sun exposure is probably fine. Uh, products are all over the place. Usually, you have anything from like a 400 unit product all the way up to prescription only five uh, 50,000 unit products. So, if you have somebody you test vitamin D on, they come back really low. A lot of times, what you're going to do is put them on that 50,000 unit product and have them take it once a week or twice a week, even for a couple of weeks until you bump their level up. Then you can maybe put them on some sort of a 1,000 or 2,000 unit a day product yeah, ongoing. Uh, toxicity is minimal. It's very, very difficult to get vitamin D toxic. And you can't get it from too much sun. You, know, you can get sunburned and skin cancer from too much 
much stuff. You can't get toxic on vitamin D. Usually it's only because you took too many supplements. And the side effects would be um, increased calcium absorption, the primary hypercalcemic, very rare GI side effects, potentially muscle pain, kidney and cardiac damage is possible, but again, it's it's pretty benign. You have to take a ton of it. Uh, vitamin E, um, there's a number of different types of vitamin E's that you'll see as synthetic versions, and their tocopherols are the different names of them. So you see like alpha tocopherol and a couple other ones, but uh, they're all the same thing really. The rule uh, with vitamin E is to protect cell membranes from oxidation and destruction. It's a free radical scavenger and protecting fatty acids. And you have uh, a couple different uses for vitamin D that have been historically pursued. So the first one was uh, some big evidence looking at vitamin E with CD events. So it's thought that a deficiency could poss possibly trigger LDL related oxidative stress, causing some sort of a plaque rupture in a, a CD event. Uh, but supplementation has not been shown to actually be beneficial in preventing heart disease. So a lot of trials look at this. Years ago, like maybe five, ten years ago, a lot of people were taking vitamin E for this reason. They've pretty much all gone off of it. There's not a lot of use of this anymore. And it's quite abundant in the diet, too. It's really prevalent in, in a large variety of things from grains to fruits, vegetables, to meats, whatever. So it's very easy to take your daily come on um, the standard diet. Uh, toxicity. So normal doses are probably pretty safe for most people. Higher doses link to hemorrhagic stroke, actually. Um, so they're thought that if you take a lot of vitamin D chronically, you can antagonize vitamin K's clotting role and therefore put yourself at um, higher risk for uh, bleed. Um, there was also a large meta-analysis that showed risk of all-cause mortality increased with chronically high doses. So vitamin E is one of those ones where, kind of like vitamin A, you want to cap it at 400 units per day and call it good. Um, medicinal uses, so what do people take this for? Macular degeneration is part of that um, eye formulation, like the Occupy Preservation product. So they call it ARIDS formulation. And I can't remember exactly. ARIDS was this name of the study that looked at this specific formulation. I don't know what it stands for, but basically, again, it's vitamin E, uh, lutein, and there's like zinc and some other things in formula. <coughs> Those are pretty much the two major ones. Um, there has been some promising um, mild evidence that it might slow Alzheimer's progression, but it, again, it's a bit sketchy at this point. Uh, and then tardive dyskinesia is something we'll talk about more with schizophrenia um, associated with antipsychotic therapy, but it may protect against that. So, at low doses, it's relatively benign. Just, if you're going to get some B vitamin D for any reason, just make sure you're capping it at 400 per day. Vitamin K, we talked about this with respect to warfarin. Um, comes as part of a lot of different supplements, and uh, usually with supplements and multivitamins, it's really, really low. So, like, if we need to reverse somebody's warfarin, we have special higher dose formulations that you can give with a prescription that will work a lot quicker and give them a lot more vitamin K. And we can also give vitamin K at high B if we really need to. It doesn't work all that fast, but it does bypass the GI tract at least. Uh, so, that's its major role in therapy. As far as everything else it does in the body, it's responsible for synthesizing clotting factors. So, you do need it. Um, you can get it from fish oils, meats, leafy green vegetables are the, are the big ones there. Um, and it also can be synthesized by various GI bacteria depending on how healthy your colonic flora is. So that can be a source as well. Most people don't really get, um, unless you're really malnourished, you probably aren't going to get to a point where you have no clotting factor available. Usually you only see that really in like not a lot of patients with a non functioning liver. Your liver is pretty good at making do with whatever vitamin K it has. Um, toxicity, if you gave somebody a ton of vitamin K, it's pretty minimal. Um, so when we have somebody with uh, like uh, severe cirrhosis that comes in, their liver is totally shot, and their INR is like six, if they are down warfarin, um, we can just load them up with a massive amount of IV vitamin K, and it doesn't really do anything adverse. So it might help them rebuild their clotting factors if their liver is still working a little bit. It's not going to cause any problems. And if you give that to a healthy person, they shouldn't overmake clotting factors. Your body should be able to regulate that. Um, and again, the toxicity is pretty minimal overall. All right, vitamin C, ascorbic acid associated with pirates who didn't eat enough fruit and vegetables, uh, and sailors, I should say, in general. Uh, so scurvy is the ability, poor ability to synthesize collagen. Not really an issue anymore, uh, but you might see it in, if you practice medicine in areas from underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped countries. You see this in places with famine or um, issues accessing um, steady food supplies. Action. So, uh, what does vitamin C do? Reducing agent for biologic processes involving copper and iron. It's a cofactor, enzyme complement, and antioxidant. It also has to do with prostate and metabolism. 
Roles in therapy, there aren't really any. <laughs> so vitamin C is probably one of the most common vitamins people just take for, for no reason, more or less. Um, the current evidence does not really support any uh, thing with vitamin C. The only thing that, that maybe, maybe has some evidence is that if you take a ton of vitamin C um, prior to brief periods of physical stress or a cold environment or something where you think you're going to catch a cold, um, you might be able to boost your immune system to the point where you can fend up the, the attack more easily. However, several studies have also disproven that show that it doesn't actually make any difference. Remember, it's a water-soluble vitamin. The one st study that showed it worked was a very high dose vitamin C, so I don't know. It, it's something that it's pretty benign if you want to do it and it makes you feel good to take your airborne or whatever and go for it, but there's no evidence to back it up, really. Yeah. So. This isn't really about vitamin C, it's kind of more on the regulation side, but I see a lot of like doctor, like number one doctor recommended. Oh, yeah. Does that like ever have to count for me? I don't think so. I think they yeah, probably did a survey. Okay. I just um, saw like number one. They probably did like a like, skewed survey. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of those fine products would you recommend? Airborne, airborne, or airborne? <laughs> Uh, and also, Airborne is created by a school teacher, which should get everyone so much faith. Not to dig on school teachers, but I'm sorry you don't have any background in pharmaceutical <laughs> manufacturing, so I don't trust it. Uh, <laughs> uh, toxicity for vitamin C, not a lot. Again, you take a ton, just like with anything, you can get to the eyes side of it. Um, the moral of the story, fruit of any kind is really high in vitamin C. Like if you eat an apple, you're probably going to get enough vitamin C. I'm not a dietitian, so don't, don't quote me on that. But um, I, I think what I've, from what I've read, you know, it's very easy to get this in a daily diet without even going overboard on fruits and vegetables. So. All right, uh, moving into some of the B vitamins, there's quite a few of them. Um, thiamine's an interesting one, or vitamin B1, uh, because it's the first to deplete upon malnourishment. So people who are alcoholics, anorexic, or status post GI surgery, for whatever reason, you're malnourished. Could be some other things that I didn't list there, of course, too. Um, it's an important cofactor for amino acid and carbohydrate metabolism. And people who get deficient on it can develop a couple of really actually serious complications. So the big one, very, very is kind of an odd one that, that I won't talk about. There's a bunch of side effects here. I don't think people see that all that commonly in the United States. However, um, Wernicke Korsakoff is not common, but it is something that happens to alcoholic patients. So Wernicke's is encephalopathy that acutely leads to something called Korsakoff syndrome, which is the result of the encephalopathy causing brain damage, more or less. So what happens is you get oxidative damage, mitochondrial injury, and a pro-apoptotic pathway. Most of that's due to the fact that you can't start metabolizing amino acids and carbohydrates properly. Your brain's not getting enough energy sources, and so that's, I think, the stem of it, is theoretically. It is a well-documented um, thing that happens in alcoholic patients, too. So you can treat this by giving people really high dose vitamins. So if you work in any acute area or maybe in an addiction medicine or whatever, and you have alcoholic patients coming in, one of the first things you give an alcoholic patient is a shot, or if they can take an oral supplement, you can give it orally too. But we do have IV thiamine, for why we have that IV available, it's because of this. If somebody was in Wernicke's, uh, you can give really high doses of IV. There's virtually no risk at overdosing somebody on it, so you can really hit people with, with massive doses to try and um, boost that, uh, that level back up to normal. Uh, vitamin B2 riboflavin is a uh, biochemical reaction vitamin that has a bunch of different energy producing respiratory pathways, mitochondrial things that happen. And for the most part, people don't usually get too deficient in this. Uh, if you take a super B vitamin, it's going to be part of it. Uh, but I don't really want you to know anything more about riboflavin. B3 is niacin. We talked about niacin a lot with respect to cholesterol, which is really the only. Um, uh, scientifically based use for this drug, uh, as, as a drug per se, as a supplement. Again, you're going to see it in a lot of different multivitamins, B vitamin complexes. And you can get issues with deficiency. There's this thing called pellagra, which can happen. Very uncommon unless you're severely malnourished. So I'm not going to see that a lot, but it is a possibility. Uh, pyridoxine is a pretty similar story to what I just talked about. The only difference with pyridoxine is its first line for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy um, combined with the antihistamine and anticholinergic drug doxalamine. So doxalamine uh, plus pyridoxine comes as a product called Diclegis, which I didn't put on there intentionally. Uh, never prescribe anyone Diclegis as a brand name, please. It's super expensive. 
some drug company had the great idea to combine two over the counter cheap medicines and charge an astronomical amount for it. Um, it's not worth it. You can just give people the over the counter version. So, B6 plus doxalamine is first line is category A, not the amount of being pregnancy. Evidence is pretty weak to support it um, being all that effective, but it's benign and some people will get effect from it. So, uh, it is worth trying. We'll talk about that more during OB a little bit. Uh, and then you have other B vitamins. We talked about B12 and folic acid with respect to anemia and their important roles. They have very important roles with respect to that. And folic acid has an important role in pregnancy, preventing spina bifida, which we'll talk about during OB too. So I'm not trying to gloss over these too much, but we'll neither already talked about them or we'll come back to them later. Okay, uh, vitamin questions before we move on to herbal products. Okay. All right, herbal products. Um, there's a website called Natural Database, which is actually pretty good. It's a, um, some places require you to have a subscription to access it, but if you do have it, it's one of the better sites out there that tells you how to look at herbal products. So you can type in things. It tells you what evidence is available, what people generally take it for, which isn't helpful because people take herbal products for literally everything. You'll see a paragraph of indications, but it'll tell you some of the more common ones at least. So you can figure out drug interactions, things like that. It's a pretty helpful website. Um, complementary and alternative medicine basically comes down to whole medical systems. So you're looking at the concept of the body healing itself. And homeopathy and naturopathic medicine kind of fall into this too. I'm not going to talk very much about those. I'll touch base on homeopathy in a little bit. Uh, but all these things kind of go under CAM, and herbal supplementation would be a, a branch of that too. Okay, so there's a study done a while ago that said that surveyed a bunch of people. So who is more likely to use an herbal supplement, women or men? Women. Correct. Women is correct. Uh, over 45 or under 45? Under. Actually under, according to this survey. So. Um, Caucasian versus other ethnicities. And it's sorry about the politically incorrect other ethnicities use and it's dumb, but that's how they did the survey. So anyway, <laughs> Caucasian versus other. Caucasian, Caucasian was, was according to the survey. Um, East versus West Coast? College or no college? I try to find newer surveys like this, but apparently no one does that. Probably just for fun. Anyway. Um, sales, most of these are occurring outside standard retailers, so internet, TV shopping, natural and health food stores sell this stuff, um, which makes the regulation even more and more sketchy. My aunt, who's a great person um, and takes care of herself very well, but she takes a bunch of supplements, and, which is fine, but she's telling me, well, I buy these at the, the co-op, and you know, they're made locally. Like, well, who knows what you're buying? <laughs> Somebody in their garage making supplements. <laughs> um, this is an old survey, but just to give you uh, kind of a glimpse at what people take as far as uh, herbal products. So these are really specific to herbs and maybe some other things. Uh, one thing that I would say is omega 3 is if you were to survey everyone today, which is several years later, uh, omega 3s would probably be way on the top of this. And the other one that's had on here is uh, Coenzyme Q10. But otherwise, ignoring the percentages a little bit, you get a feeling for generally what people take on. We talked about glucosamine hydrate already, so we'll skip that one. And 20% of the people, according to this survey, reported using four or more products, which probably makes sense. So I think if you're either, I can put people into kind of two categories when it comes to supplements. You can either take them because somebody recommended it to you, and you're kind of on the fence, you're like, okay, I'll take your vitamin D, maybe it'll help, whatever. Or you're all in on supplements, and you take like 20. So it's, it's more or less what I see at the hospital. Uh, all right, black cohosh is a product that uh, has similar effects to estrogen in the body. We'll talk about hormone replacement therapy during women's health, so we haven't really gotten there yet. The full mechanism's not understood, but it's thought to have some sort of estrogen receptor activity. Um, it does has been shown to produce a modest reduction in hot flashes in short studies, and other studies have not shown benefit, especially long term. Uh, but it could be an alternative for people who want to try something non-hormonal per se. However, it's probably interfering with the hormonal process at some level because it's working. So I question it is being a true non-hormonal product compared to some of the prescription hormone replacement therapies. Um, side effects, mild GI side effects, breast tenderness, vaginal spotting, or bleeding. Again, pointing to this is definitely some estrogen activity. Just exactly how it's working is a bit uh, um, not well understood. Pregnancy and breastfeeding contraindicated. Um, active breast cancer, probably best to avoid it. Um, usually with active breast cancer, you're manipulating hormones carefully. You don't want a third party coming in and monkeying things up. Uh, and then there's enzyme. Uh, I put all the enzyme inhibitions on here. And the, the 
moral of the story is that all these products pretty much have very heavy drug interaction problems with them, which is another reason generally not to take them. If you have somebody on a really complicated medication regimen and you don't want their enzymes being interfered with, don't recommend or make sure they're getting off supplements. It can be really problematic in the long term. But um, if they're on much, it's not a big deal, so for the most part. But these all pretty much have pretty decent uh, uh, interactions. Um, okay, cranberry juice. Uh, prevents adhesions of bacteria to cells lining the urinary tract. So for UTI prevention, this will not do anything if somebody has an active urinary tract infection. And you have to consume about 10 ounces of cranberry juice daily. And that's actual cranberry juice. So if you're drinking pounded cranberry cocktail or vodka cranberries, not going to work very well for you. Um, you're, you could put yourself at risk for diabetes, or put your patient at risk for diabetes. Um, or alcohol is <laughs> but, but there was a study that showed it did prevent UTIs in younger and older women, so it is something that could be done. Have you ever had pure cranberry juice? In the My wife loves it. It's super acidic. Uh, if you've ever tried it, yeah, it's really, really sour. So I don't imagine a lot of people are going to tolerate it all that much. If you love sour stuff, then go for it. It's kind of like drinking sour patch you get on steroids. For me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Uh, side effects, GI upset is an obvious one. Uh, if somebody is wanting to use this and they're like, well, I really like it, but I'm getting some heartburn, well, yeah, it's acidic, maybe they can take it with like a H2 blocker or something. Take some tums afterwards or something like that. Um, consideration, so capsules of cranberry are not as effective as actual pure juice, believe it or not. And um, the pure juice component is what we want to consider. So um, general fluid intake, diabetic and obese patients are something to think about. The pure cranberry juice is really low in sugar content, so it actually probably wouldn't affect a diabetic patient all that much. It's just that cocktail you want to be really careful of if they're like, getting it mixed with something else. Um, cranberry juice also contains salicyl salicylate, which is um, something that can have aspirin-like effects, so just to keep in mind with allergic patients or people who have some reason not to take aspirin, so maybe like a young adult, like a, a teenage girl who wants to prevent UTI, is probably not a great idea. Uh, due to the race syndrome risk. And uh, again, it inhibits enzymes. So specifically cranberry juice and warfarin therapy is one. But occasionally we see people doing a lot of cranberry juice on warfarin and their INRs are way out of whack. That can really affect it, actually. It's one of the, the ones that we really have some decent uh, evidence to support there. Uh, echinacea. Echinacea is a, uh, there's a flower there that's isolated from it. It's thought to boost immune system general health, and it's thought to stimulate cytokine and white blood cell production. Um, using it, uh, studies have shown that it may be effective at preventing and shortening the duration of a common cold. Um, take at onset of symptoms for seven to 10 days, and you might get some relief. Uh, side effects, GI allergic uh, reactions. So people who have allergies to things like ragweed or other general like seasonal allergies can respond poorly to this product because it's similar um, the, the flower itself is related to those, those plants. Um, chronic use has been linked in some cases to hepatotoxicity. Uh, inhibits and induces a couple different common uh, SIP enzymes. Um, garlic. Garlic has an unknown mechanism of action. People take it uh, supposedly for general heart health. Um, studies have shown it has a very minimal effect on blood pressure reduction. So it's been studied for hypertension to a 2 to 5 percent reduction really nothing. Um, virtually no effect on cholesterol management either. Side effects, GI-related heartburn, um, gas, and odor. Yeah, it doesn't hit platelet aggregation to a certain extent, too, so that could be a negative uh, side effect. There's a couple products out there that don't have an odor associated with them. Um, as far as this product goes, it really doesn't have any uh, proven use of, of being affected for any condition. So really don't take, I wouldn't recommend garlic for any person. Yeah. So at one point we talked in one of our small group classes, uh, someone looked it up in their learning issue, it claimed it can cure like almost everything. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the thing about all these supplements, you'll probably find evidence to support whatever you want. And that's like if you go to the natural <laughs> database, you can find, uh, and evidence I use very loosely, and you can find what people take it for. It's anything from common cold prevention to like HIV management. Like you have every, you know, it's, it's insane. So. Um, yeah, take that stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of studies really to show, but there are, these are the ones where it's actually what gallons to be like, has any impact on these areas and it wasn't shown to. Um, you would want to discontinue a garlic supplement seven to ten days prior to pregnancy. 
or prior to, prior to surgery, excuse me, <laughs> could plan that. Okay. Uh, prior to surgery, but that's the best way that I can it. Um, pregnancy, probably not, uh, and uh, increased bleeding risk, so be careful with NSAIDs, work 